Here is a poem called Poem <laughs> in, in, uh, in honor of the new holiday, Juneteenth. It's by a woman named Helene Johnson, who was a figure in the Harlem Renaissance in the teens and 20s and 30s, right across the river from us. And the poem goes like this. Little brown boy, slim, big, dark-eyed, crooning love songs to your banjo down at the Lafayette. Gee, boy, I love the way you hold your head. High, sort of, and a bit on one side, like a prince, a jazz prince. And I love your eyes flashing and your hands and your patent leather feet and your shoulders jerking the jigwa. And I love your teeth flashing and the way your hair shines in the spotlight like it was the real stuff. Gee, brown boy, I loves you all over. I'm glad I jig. I'm glad I can understand your dancing and your singing and feel all the happiness and joy and don't care in you. Gee, boy, when you sing, I can close my ears and hear Tom Tom's playing. <laughs> Listen to me, will you? What do I know about Tom Toms? But I like the word, sort of, don't you? It belongs to us. Gee, boy, I love the way you hold your head and the way you sing and dance and everything. Say, I think you're wonderful. You're all right with me. You are. Poem by Helene Johnson celebrating Juneteenth. Thank you. Susan, will you share another poem, please, for Father's Day? Okay. Oh. Okay, a poem on Father's Day. Shoulders by Naomi Shihab Nye. She's an Arab American poet. A man crosses the street in rain, stepping gently looking two times north and south because his son is asleep on his shoulder. No car must splash him, no dr car drive too near to his shadow. This man carries the world's most sensitive cargo, but he's not marked. Nowhere does his jacket say fragile, handle with care. His ear fills up with breathing, he hears the hum of a boy's dream deep inside him. We're not going to be able to live in this world if we're not willing to do what he's doing with one another. The road will only be wide. The rain will never stop falling. Shoulders by Naomi Shihab Nye. Just want to check to see if anybody in Zoom land tuned in on the idea of a Juneteenth or a Father's Day poem. Our announcement wasn't particularly thorough on that score. No, I don't think so. Okay, we covered it. We did it. <laughs> Good. Now, those who've come in person and chosen a poem have their chance to share here in the room with, and with everybody on Zoom. We'll do two uh, poetasters is the term. <laughs> two people sharing their poetry, uh, their poetry choices here. And then we'll go to anyone who's chosen something from Zoom. It, please come up, 
You can take your mask off, use this microphone, tell us the name of the poem and the poet that you're reciting. Anybody ready to come up? Mary Ann, need some help? Great, good for you. Yeah, I got up and I can walk. Isn't that amazing? Thank goodness, because I get vertigo. Not so good. <laughs> oh, I could, I could do that. So I have uh, William Shakespeare. Oh. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day, Shakespeare? Um, hmm. Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines by chance or nature's changing course, untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou art nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, their eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. That's Shakespeare. Now I'm gonna sing you a little, I'm gonna sing you a little song, even though nobody invited me to, but I feel like doing that. <laughs> Summertime and the living is easy. Fish are jumping and the cotton is high. Your daddy's rich and your ma's good looking. So hush, little baby, don't you cry. One of these mornings you're gonna rise up singing. You'll spread your wings and you'll take to the sky but till that morning there's nothing can harm you with mammy and daddy standing by oh thank you so much that combines summertime and father's day i think in a very nice way <laughs> Uh, Richard and I were talking about that poem just this morning as a possibility here. So do we have anybody else here in the room who would like to share a poem that they've chosen? Susan? Okay. I have a Mary Oliver poem. I have a Mary Oliver poem, Why I Picked It. Because with the title that I've chosen is When the Roses Speak, I Pay Attention. And I think of roses as a summertime flower. And um, I know they take a little bit of care, uh, so I don't have them growing <laughs> in my yard. Um, my parents had a wild uh, tea rose um, growing in their backyard, just a brambling bush, and I always loved them. So when I came across, when we were looking for summertime poems, I came across this, and, uh, and it speaks to me of summer. So Mary Oliver, when the roses speak, I pay attention. As long as we are able to be extravagant we will be hugely and damply extravagant. Then we will drop foil by foil to the ground. This is on our unalterable task, and we do it joyfully. And they went on. Listen, the heart shackles are not, as you think, death, illness, pain, unrequited hope, not loneliness, but lassitude, rue, vainglory, fear, anxiety, selfishness. 
their fragrance all the while rising from their blind bodies, making me spin with joy. Yes, Mary Oliver is awesome. <laughs> uh, now, uh, we uh, connect to our Zoom audience and wonder if anyone has a summer poem they would like to share. Greg, anyone's got their hand up? Nobody's hands are up quite yet. Okay, they're just drinking it in here. <laughs> Uh, all right, just give us a second, Susanna. If no one uh, from Zoom is leaping in there, then uh, we'll hear from Susanna. Please come up, Susanna. Yeah, poems from the table. That's why they're there. Here's the microphone. Go ahead, take the mask off. Okay. Tell us the name of the poem, the poet, and why you picked it. The poem is Voices of the Air. Uh, it's nice because it's springtime and I thought it was um, pertinent. Um, Voices of the Air, Catherine Mansfield. But then there comes that moment rare when for no cause that I can find the little voices of the air sound above all the sea and wind. The sea and wind do then obey and sighing, sighing, sighing double notes of double basses content to pay, play a droning chord for the little throats. The little throats that sing and rise up into the light with lo lovely ease and a kind of magical sweet surprise. To hear and know themselves for, the, for these, for these little voices the bee the fly, the leaf that taps, the pod that breaks, the breeze on the grass tops bending by, the shrill quick sound that the insect makes. Voices in the air. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Catherine Mansfield died very young, but she was very influential at the turn of the 19th century, 20th century, avant-garde poetry, I learned. <laughs> Ah, uh, okay. Here's a poem from Athena now. Great. <laughs> well, that's my job. <laughs> um, here's a poem. This is a Okay. Uh, this is Pablo Neruda, Neruda, Ode to Enchanted Light. And I picked it because this picture reminds me of my yard when the sun shines in the window. Under the trees light has dropped from the top of the sky, light like a green latticework of branches, shining on every leaf, drifting down to clean a sick uh, the clean white sand. A cicada sends its sawing song high into the empty air. The world is a glass overflowing with water. Ode to Enchanted Light. I picked the poem because of the picture, because my backyard also is full of green light. It's wonderful stuff. Yeah. Uh. So, uh, do we have any other contributions from the room? I dragooned Richard into participating. <laughs> and he said, yes, of course, my, to my dear wife. <laughs> Okay, you're going to ask, you ask me why I picked picked it is because it was selected. It's a curated poem from the table, so this is one of the from the table poems. But it's a it's a new po it's a new poem. It's uh, published 2018, and it's written by George Bilger. It's called Stargazer. 
midnight, midsummer, a man steps out to his backyard and listens to the crickets pining for other crickets. A dog barks at the cosmos. While others lounge in their barca loungers, the man is having a kind of Dover Beach moment in which he hopes to have an immense thought or two. So he looks up at the glittering God Haven, and there's the Milky Way, the Pleiades, along with some quarks, uh, dwarf stars, and supernovas. And the thought the man has is of insignificance. Under the bright furnaces of Orion, he contemplates his inconsequentiality. It is a good feeling to have for several minutes, reflects the man who is holding a glass of Pinot Noir. It puts things in perspective. But it's also good to go back inside and resume one's place in front of the local and regional news, if only to get to some degree one's significance back. Always strong in a pinch, my husband. <laughs> oh. Okay, I, oh, oh, bravo, a hand. Someone's phoning in, and Greg, can you help that person connect with us? For, with can you phone? hear me? Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. Now we can. This is, Ka this is Carol. Wh who's, who's reading to us, please? Carol Gottlieb. Oh, hi, Carol. Please. Now, this poem is about a bird I met when I went to visit my son. This took place on an island on Cedar Key. And these birds were as big as me. I met them nose to nose, or should I say beak to beak. I shall begin. <clears throat> the poem is called The Pelican, and this wonderful poem was given to me by my friend Rudy Bram. And I shall recite. A wonderful bird is the pelican. His bill can hold more than his belly can. He can put more food in his beak. Uh, hmm. Food in his beak, I can't even read my writing. He can put more food in his beak But I don't know how the hell he can. Well, perhaps we can come back to this poem. And th does anyone recall, is this an Ogden Nash kind of poem along these lines? It sure sounds like it. Yeah. Well, Carol, if you'll pin down who wrote that poem, let us know. I believe that was Ogden Nash. Um, it, it was one of my dad's favorite. When she, Carol, when you were reciting it, I could picture him reciting it. Good. And it's been a lot of years now, so. Uh, um, I'd like to share a poem that uh, I bumped into compiling these things. Summer in England, you don't think of it as burning hot, but compared to winter, it's probably very enjoyable. <laughs> so William Blake, the famous visionary, uh, right, sorry. Um, this is a poem by 
William Blake called To Summer. Uh, he was English. You don't think of English summers as like really memorable <laughs> uh, in our tropical vacation mindset, but I'm sure compared to English winters, they're fabulous. So Blake wrote this in the around 1800, 1810. To the sun, to summer. O thou who passest through our valleys in thy strength, curb thy fierce steeds, allay the heat that flames from their large nostrils. The sun god, this is. Thou, O summer, oft pitchedest here thy golden tent, and oft beneath our oaks has slept, while we beheld with joy thy ruddy limbs and flourishing hair. Beneath our thickest shades we oft has, have heard thy voice, when noon upon his fervid car rode o'er the deep of heaven. Beside our springs sit down, and in our mossy valleys, on some bank beside a river clear, throw thy silk draperies off and rush into the stream. Our valleys love the summer in his pride. Our bards are famed who strike the silver wire. Our youth are bolder than the southern swains, like Italians or Greeks. <laughs> Our maidens fairer in the sprightly dance. We lack not songs, nor instruments of joy, nor echoes sweet nor waters clear as heaven, nor laurel wreaths against the sultry heat. To Summer by William Blake. <laughs> Thank you. I love the idea of the sun god going skinny dipping. <laughs> That's kind of funny. All right. Any other choices to read aloud to our poetry circle? Susan? Okay. This is from the table. Solstice by Tess Taylor. How again today our patron star, whose ancient vista is the long view, turns its wide brightness now and here. Below, we loll outdoors, sing, and make fire. We build no henge, but after our swim, linger by the pond, dapples flicker pine trunks by the water. Buzz and hum and wing and song combine. Light builds a monument to its passing. Frogs content themselves in bullish chirps. Hoop skirt blossoms on thimbleberries fall. Peeper toads hop, lazy. Apex. The throaty world sings, ripen. Our grove slips past the sun's long kiss. We dress. We head home in other starlight. Our earthly time is sweetening from this. Solstice by Tess Taylor. I love this. The in imagery here is really fabulous. And, and um, we're going camping. David is not a camper, so he's not joining us. But we're, my sister and I are going camping in cabins. And, and this really, uh, these images and these sounds, it really gets it. So there we go. Yay. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for another testimonial. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right, we're, oh, great, another hand. Dwight, please share with us. 
Good morning. I, I, I someone read a, a Mary Oliver, and I, I couldn't resist going for a favorite summer poem. It's the summer day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild? and precious life. Thanks. Thank you. That's, right. That's Mary Oliver, right? Yes. Yes. See, we said Mary Oliver is awesome. Your mic, your mic. All right. That thank you, Dwight, for another Mary Oliver, awesome Mary Oliver poem. Um, okay, I think we've come to the, oh yes, very good. One more, please. We gonna sit down? Okay. Not at not at all. <laughs> Hello, folks. Again, uh, this is a humanistic poem that I learned a long time ago. And thank you. Yes, dear. yes, my dear. <laughs> uh, so it's called the Boo Ben Adam. It was written a long, long time ago. Uh, maybe in the 1600s, I'm not sure, by a man named Lee Hunt, I think. And uh, my mother said she learned it in school. And when I was reciting it, she was uh, happy to hear it again. So it's a boob in autumn. May his tribe increase. Awoke one night from a deep dream of peace and saw within the moonlight of his room making it rich and like a lily in bloom, an angel writing in a book of gold. Exceeding peace had made Ben Adam bold. And to the presence in the room, he said, What writest thou? The angel raised its head and with a look made all of sweet accord, said, The names of those who love the Lord. And am I one? asked the boo. Nay, not so, replied the angel. A boo spoke more lo slow, low, but cheerfully still, and said, Then write me as one who loves his fellow man. The angel wrote and vanished. The next night, she came back with a great wakening light and showed the list of names whom love of God had blessed. And lo, Ben Adam's name led all the rest. <laughs> Very nice. Very humanistic. Very humanistic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and please note, Mary Ann recited that from memory. <laughs> I could not do that anymore. <laughs> no siree. <laughs> Maybe a nursery rhyme, but that's it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to finish our poetry circle with one more poem. Uh, we're having a kind of Sunday service here, so I'd like to share uh, a well-known poem by Emily Dickinson. Um, she, of course, was deep into religious terminology and philosophy. Um, she wrote this around 1852 when she decided, after experiencing a kind of evangelical moment in her New England community that she participated in, 
she saw the problems in that and stepped away from formal religion um, af after that experience. And she was a ardent gardener who spent a lot of time outdoors compared to a lot of middle class women in her day and age. So here we go. Some Keep the Sabbath Going to Church by Emily Dickinson. Some keep the Sabbath going to church. I keep it staying at home with a bobolink for a chorister and an orchard for a dome. Some keep the Sabbath in surplus. I just wear my wings, and instead of tolling the bell for church, our little sexton sings. God preaches a noted clergyman, and the sermon is never long. So instead of getting to heaven at last, I'm going all along. Emily Dickinson. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. <laughs> so